and figure out what period of time we're talking about and where are we? Can anybody tell me what period of time we're in right here where we're talking about Acts the 19th chapter? Where is this on this chart? Can you point to me where that is? Where is it? In where? Where in the church age? Right about here. Just right after the cross. Okay, just right after the cross. That's where we are. And now Paul is in Ephesus. He is preaching. He, uh, I want you to understand the Roman government through Tiberius originally protected the Christian people from the what? Who were the problems? What was the greatest enemy of the Christian people? The Jews. All right. Judaism from without or Judaism from without and Judaism from within. That was the problem with the church, and we still have that today. Still have that problem today. And it says, about the time there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. And now what is this, the way there, Brother Roger? You remember what that, the way is? What they called the early Christian church. The early Christian church was the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, now, what is the name Demetrius today? We, I know Dimitri, Demetrius, and all that. By the way, my name is Demetrius in Greek. So what is that name? It's Jimmy. Jim. Jimmy. Jim or Jimmy. Demas is Jim. Demetrius is Jimmy. All right? And there's feminine and masculine in both of those. In English, uh, the feminine is J-I-M-M-I-E, and the masculine is J-M-M-I or J-M-M-Y. Now, I wrote my name, J-M-M-I-E, because that's the way my grandmother taught me how to write it. But she didn't know the difference between the masculine and the feminine in, in the spelling of the name of Jimmy. And you'll see that in many, many different languages. A man named uh, Demetrius, uh, Jimmy, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis who was bringing in no little business to the craftsmen. And these ha he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know about our prosperity. It depends upon this business. Now, these are the gold and the silversmiths. All right? These are the, uh, these are the artisans that uh, uh, mold and pound out and hammer out these images. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of the people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. And not only is there a danger to this trade of ours uh, to fall into this disrepute, but also that the temple, the, the great goddess Artemis, be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship should even be dethroned from her magnificence. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage. They kept on being filled with rage, and they kept on crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, Artemis is also called the, the goddess Diana. All right? The goddess Diana. And the city was filled with a confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius. Now, Gaius is Gaius Titus Justus. That's his full name, Gaius Titus Justus. And then we have Aristarchus. Aristarchus. Now he is a traveling companion of Paul and a fellow Christian. But who was the original Aristarchus? You know who the original Aristarchus? He was a Greek astronomer. And this Greek astronomer was the one that fixed the solar system at the sun being the center of our solar system and that all the planets around the sun revolved around the sun and that the earth revolved rotated on its axis and so this was a brilliant Greek scholar and this man was named after this scholar now he isn't the same guy all right this Greek scholar lived from 310 to about 230 BC yes so is this Gaius is that Titus from the letter Titus yeah Titus so that's Gaius, Gaius. Titus justice and that's the yeah. same person. yes okay. mm -hmm. Gaius is a title uh, which was of royalty and uh, Gaius uh, and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And Paul wanted to go into the assembly. Now, this word assembly here 
and the disciples would not let him. And the disciples, his disciples, now his disciples, there is the ecclesia. This assembly here is not that word. Nicodemus is made up of two Greek words, Nico, Nico and Demos. What does Nicodemus mean? Do you remember that, Sharon? Nicodemus? Crowdbuster? Crowdbuster. A mob buster. Now this is a mob. This assembly here is a mob. It's a demos. That word demos right there. I can't spell in English. <laughs> I started trying to write in English this morning. I couldn't do it. Every time it turns into Greek. Anyway, demos. Uh, D-A-M-O-S, basically. Demos. This is a demos. Nicodemus was a crowd or a mob buster. And here we have a mob and we have an ecclesia. The ecclesia is a... Uh, uh, a called out, bona fide, certified legal assembly. Now this demos is a mob. And would not let him. And then verse 31, and some of the Asiarchs, and by the way, the name uh, Aristocus means uh, uh, honorable, most. Uh, best ruler means best ruler that's what it means now here's some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent him to and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater now the theater is where the mob was and the mob is made up of the artisans and I'll tell you who's on the other side of these artisans the Jews now let's go on a little bit further and so then some of them uh, some of them were shouting and some another for the assembly, this demos, and was in confusion, and the majority did not know what the cause they had come together. They didn't even know why they had gathered this mob. And some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander since the Jews had put him forward. Alexander, now here Alexander, uh, this guy is a, um, he's a Jewish leader. And Alexander is going to stand up here and say, we Jews are not related to this Paul. Paul is not stating our beliefs. Okay? He's telling them that he's not stating their beliefs, that, that he's a Jew all right, but he sure isn't believe what we believe. And since the Jews had put him forward, and having motion with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly, to the crowd, to the mob. Now this assembly here is not the church. This is a mob held in a coliseum. And this mob has come to complain about Paul and his companions about preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And after quieting the multitude, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus. Now here's the town clerk. This is the official. This is High Sharif, the High Sheriff, so to speak. What man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of the, of, of the Ephesians is a guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, and the image which fell down from heaven? And since these are, these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and to do nothing. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers or t of temples nor blasphemers or goddess. So then if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available, let them bring charges against one another. Now in the Roman government, freedom of religion was a necessity as far as they were concerned. Did you know that? In the Roman government, they believed in freedom of religion, so they allowed all of these things to take place. Now let's go back and let's talk about falling rocks. Falling rocks, that's the title of the message, falling rocks. Now, have you ever heard of falling rock, Arizona? Falling rocks, Nevada? Falling rocks, California? I knew a guy one time, and he said, I live way out in the sticks, and here I am living out in the sticks always in my life. I never lived in town in my life. But he said, uh, <clears throat> did you go by that place in Arizona where it said Falling Rocks? And I said, yeah, there's a lot of places like that. And he said, well, I live out there in Falling Rocks, Arizona. 
And I, when I lived up in Fish Lake Valley, you had to go by these things. It said falling rocks, falling rocks, falling rocks. Well, that's what it's talking about. But we're going to talk about different kind of falling rocks now. Falling rocks sometimes in ancient past were um, a meteorites. Now, over there in Arizona, there is a great meteor crater over there, and I have one of those pieces of that uh, meteor that hit the ground over there. Now, that uh, uh, meteor crater was, was a tremendous uh, explosion on the earth when it hit the earth, and I mean it's big, and it shook things terribly, and it left these pieces of rocks. Well, according to Islamic history, and according to this history here that we're talking about right here, we have two parallel people, two parallel gods. That these gods, they say the gods, the image of the god fell out of heaven and hit the earth. Now, according to Islamic tradition, not long after the time of Adam, there was a, a meteor coming down out of the sky and these Bedouins were out there with their camels and their herds and everything and they were uh, uh, looking in the sky and they saw this great roaring rock meteor which they thought was a god. And they followed this and they thought it hit on the ground over there not too far from them. When I was in Nevada and lived up in Nevada, I was talking on the radio one night. I had a radio room built off, the, off of the side of my mobile home, and I had the back door open, and, and I heard this roaring sound in the heavens like there was a thousand freight trains in heaven. And here it come, and I mean the whole place lit up, and it went over there. I thought it was some type of a falling meteor, and anyway, I thought it was right there. And at Bishop, they thought it hit in Fish Lake Valley. And I thought it was, you know, I hear the thing coming over the White Mountains. I mean, it's roaring. And the White Mountains are 14,000 foot high. Well, it went over the White Mountains, and it went over the next step of mountains over there, which is the Silver Peaks, and went all the way in the, in the state of Arizona and hit the ground someplace. It was space junk. But that's like when a meteor hits the Earth. And I don't know what piece of space junk that was, but I tell you one thing, I heard it. Well, these Bedouins were out there in the Arabian Desert in where Mecca is today. And they heard this tremendous roar in the skies and they watched this light and they thought it was a hand of God reaching down to the earth. The hand of God reaching down to the earth. And they followed it and they found over there and this stone was smoking when they found it. And so they, this must be a god falling out of heaven. So they began what is called the Kaaba. And they built a shrine around this thing and they moved it and they would come, people would come from all over and they'd worship this stone in early, early Islamic time, pre-Islamic times. Well, by the time Muhammad was born, there were 300 and something gods in this Kaaba they had a Kaaba, this stone was in the middle, people would go by there, and from ancient times they said that if they would walk around this and march around this uh, parade ground seven times and then go in there and kiss this stone that all their sins would be forgiven. And then they had, would go to the mountains, they'd have to go to one mountain peak and go to the other mountain peak and pray on all these mountain peaks. And not only would they do that, but they would bring camels or some animals and slaughter them, and mostly it was camels that they would slaughter for a sacrifice to these gods. Now they still do that today there at the Kaaba. The, uh, let's go back to Artemis again. Let's go back to Diana. Now Sharon was so kind to come up here and draw a picture now, how many of you uh, remember the hood ornaments that they had on the cars in the 20s and 30s? And they had this girl in very scantily clad, and a beautiful girl, long flowing hair, very scantily clad. You could see through her clothes. And she has a bow and an arrow. And sometimes they have a fawn or a stag by her. And this, was, and this is Diana. This is Artemis. 
that this is. Now the bowl is actually the crescent moon. Okay? Now what is one of the symbols of Islam? The crescent moon. All right? Now Artemis was called the, uh, the light bringer because this crescent moon. And on, the, on these, these ancient hood ornaments, some of these were lighted and the bowl was lighted like the moon, okay? Now that's what it was. Now let's go back. Now we talk about Deimos and we talk about Ecclesia. Now let's look at Artemis, Artemis. I tried to write it in English, but it didn't work out too good. Artemis, Artemos. Now Artemis, the root of this going way back in ancient Greek is, is throt, strot, or rot, strot or rot. Now strot, is S-T-R-A-T in English. And rot is like a H-R-A-T, rot. And that means to throw darts, arrows, missiles, whatever, that's what it means. Now, Diana was the result of uh, Zeus and, uh, and his companion, his lover, Leto. Uh, and they had twins. Artemis was born first and then Apollos. And Artemis was born first and she's the girl. And she, after she's born, she helps her mother deliver Apollos. And so among the ancient Greeks, Artemis is also the one that helps women in labor. Okay? She helps women in labor because she helped her mother. After she was born, she helped her mother deliver Apollos. And then she went to her father, uh, Zeus, and she asked, I think it was six or seven requests she made of him, that her name would be greater than Apollos, that she would continually be a virgin all of her life. She did not want uh, to get married. She wanted to be a virgin. Well, there's many, many stories of her bathing in her sacred springs and seeing so beautiful and men coming along trying to molest her, rape her, or seduce her. She had uh, one lover that she uh, really liked. Uh, well, he wasn't really a lover. He was an admirer because she was going to be uh, a perpetual virgin. But his name was Orion. Orion. Now, also in ancient Greek, uh, the word Arctos could come from this word Artemis. Arctos. Arctos means what? Anybody know, remember what Arctos means? There was a book called Arctos. Huh? No, Arctos, Marilyn. Remember the book I, you bought a long time ago about the bear, the grizzly bear named Arctos. Arctos is a Greek word for bear. Well, Arctos was the bear cult, and we have Orion in the sky, you know, and we have the bear and all of this, these different constellations, these are all part of the Diana worship. And a Diana came down from heaven because she fell, this image of her fell from heaven and landed. So they began to worship her. Now, in Arabia, we have a similar situation there. Now, in the Muslim world, uh, every Muslim has to go to hell and suffer for his sins and for his shortcomings. And they stay there for a certain period of time. The way they are forgiven of their sins is to go and march around seven times around the Kaaba, which was started much later. You know, this Kaaba was there in pre-Islamic times in its paganism. And he borrowed this paganism from them. Now we go back into uh, Ephesus where this temple of Artemis is. And they go up there and they pray and they have these idols. And, they're, and what they pray for is uh, Artemis is the goddess of the hunt. You want to go hunting, Brother Mike? You want to go hunting? All right. Well, you would get, a, you would get a, an image of Artemis because she is the goddess and the keeper of the mountains and the forest 
and she will bring you good, good luck in hunting and also accuracy in shooting because she's a master archer. That's what she is. And uh, like I said, this, this, this bow that she's using there, that is the crescent moon, and it's shining. Now you go back now, let's go back now to Egypt, or uh, not Egypt, but Arabia again. Let's go back to the Kaaba, and let's see what that cult is. We have a cult in uh, Ephesus, and by the way, this cult is all over, but the temple is, of Diana is in Ephesus now. And right here is where Paul's coming, and he's preaching the word of God, preaching that idols made with hands are nothing. Neither are falling stars and falling rocks. They're nothing. Let's go back. Let's go back to the time of uh, pre-Islamic times in, in Arabia where this stone, this meteorite, hit the earth. They come and they make these sacrifices. Now, in this place, in this Kaaba, there's all kinds of paganism. One of them is the picture of Abraham at pre-Islamic times, and Abraham had seven arrows, and he throw these arrows down. This is what they call the throwing of the arrows. It's like uh, gaming arrows, or what they call gaming arrows, or whatever, and it had messages on those arrows. The Cheyenne nation had seven sacred arrows that they would pray, and they kept them in a bundle, and supposedly they still exist and they would pray and ask God's answers from these arrows. And these arrows had, had picturesque scenes on them to tell them how to live their lives, how they should live and, and cooperate among the human beings, which are the Cheyenne people, which are Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Cheyenne. They're all closely related. They're what they call the Sundance people. You go back over there where they had these seven arrows that they throw down. Mohammed's... Uh, grandfather didn't have any children so he went to the Kaaba and he swore that he would sacrifice one of his sons if God was if Allah was and by the way Allah is basically Baal 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 Allah is Baal uh, the god Baal and he said that he would give one of his sacrifice one of his sons if he would give him this opportunist if he would you know he'd give him more children and make him rich and all of this and make his trades whatever anyway so he had more children later on and then it was reminded to him that he this son which was Muhammad's father uh, was that son that he had to give for God answering all his prayers so he went to the uh, Kaaba and he asked for the throwing of the arrows. So they threw the arrows down, threw the arrows down, threw the arrows down. And it finally said, in place of your son, he kept telling me I had to sacrifice his son, but in place of, what can I sacrifice in place of my son? So they kept throwing it down and it told him to sacrifice so many hundred can, candles, camels. And he had to give the, you know, he had to kill these camels. Camels were valuable commodity, I'm telling you. They're like Rolls Royces, you know, in the, in the desert, these camels are. Well, anyway, they'd take these camels and they'd shave their back, and when they'd mark them for slaughter, mark them for death, mar mark them for sacrifice, and they'd mark them from wherever they came, and they'd go there, and they'd, they'd take a spear, and they'd throw it through their throat, and uh, they would bleed to death. And they'd, then they would, you know, you go over there, you can get camel skin this, camel skin that. I mean, I had a camel skin hat when I went over to the Middle East. They're slaughtering camels to Muhammad all the time, you know, to Allah. And uh, so they have a lot of camel skin over there. Well, then they would take this and they would, and one of the things that they did in Mecca was they had this tanning industry of camel hides. And all of these hides went all over, and that's what... Uh, the Quraysh, that was uh, Muhammad's family, were the keepers of the Kaaba when he was born. Now, Muhammad was born and he was raised in this situation here. Every year, all the Bedouins would come to this in this sacred month to the Kaaba, so they'd march around it, 
They'd climb up on these mountains, they'd look down, they'd pray toward the Kaaba, and then they'd go down there and march around this black stone, this Aphrodite, this Artemis, this Diana stone. And they would march around this stone, and then they'd lay their hands on it and kiss it, and they say the stone, of course this is legend, but they say the stone was purest white. But because it's black now, it's because of all the sins of all of the Bedouins that ever kissed that stone. It absorbed their sins. And it forgives all their sins. According to the Islamic tradition, and one of the five pillars of the Islamic faith is you have to make this hajj to go there and, and march around this stone seven times and then kiss the stone. And all your sins are forgiven, but you still have to go to hell for a while. Anyway, unless you die in jihad. Uh, just the last few days, uh, we have the leader of ISIS, you know. He said that uh, he's calling all 1.5 mil billion Muslims in the world to the words of Allah. I'm going to read you the words of Allah and the prophet Muhammad. Now, he came... Uh, this is when he was getting ready to leave and leave Mecca and go to Medina. And uh, these people are giving him a lot of trouble because he's intolerant to their religion and all to, to all their gods. And uh, this is a Islamic history. This is Ibn Ishik, the life of Muhammad, the prophet, the apostle of God. This I could see from his expression, then he passed the third time and then he did the same. He stopped and said, will you listen to me, O Karash? By him who holds my life in his hand, I bring you slaughter. All of them were absolutely just shook. No man among anybody's family had ever said, I'm going to kill you. They were dumbfounded. After he left here, he said, I bring you slaughter. And from the, that time on in his life, when he went to Mecca, who went to Medina from Mecca, it was a warlord. It was not a prophet, a warlord. That's what spread his religion. Now, let me... Uh, talk a little bit about end times. We're talking about, you know, he's calling... This, this, this man from ISIS, this leader in ISIS, ISIS he's calling all 1.5 billion Muslims to war because he said the prophet said this. Now, let me read to you from their own writings what's going to happen in the end time. Okay? This is from them. Okay? This is what they say. <coughs> He said, in the last days there were wars and great slaughter, crushing oppression, tremendous natural catastrophes such as earthquakes will shake everything to the ground, great fires will blacken the mountains and plains. When you think things uh, can't get worse, it will get worse. Believers will fight believers, pilgrims will be robbed and murdered, fighting will occur in the holy months. Order will be given away to chaos. Adding to the turmoil, the Euphrates will suddenly uncover a mountain of gold. Now, what does the Bible say about the Euphrates in the last time? You remember that? That God is going to stop the Euphrates so the armies can move in. Now, Muhammad said that the Euphrates is going to be, there's going to be a great earthquake, and there where the Euphrates is, they're going to discover a great mountain of gold unleashing savage greed that will lead to the demise of all but one out of a hundred of the gold seekers. In other words, one out of a hundred will live. Such conditions will signal the emergency of the Iman Madeh, the Madeh, the Madeh. In the Bible, and he's called the guided one. This is from their writings. Now, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the beast, doesn't it? It talks about the false prophet. It talks about the Antichrist. 
Now, in these writings, it talks about the beast. It talks about the Iman Made, the Made, the Made, okay? And he is the guided one. And it talks about Jesus, Issa, in their language. Let me talk about these fallen rocks business. Now, according to Islamic hadiths from Muhammad, the Quran, the hadiths, the ahadiths, and the sunnahs, he says that something great and catastrophic is going to happen in Mecca. And so they're going to take that stone, this sacred falling rock, and they're going to take it to Jerusalem, and they're going to build a temple in Jerusalem for all to worship. Originally, all religions were worshipped there. Okay? And this will go on for how many years of tribulation is there here? How many years of tribulation? You know, Bonnie? Maryland? Seven years of tribulation. Do you know how long the Mahdi is going to rule? According to Islam? Seven years. Let's go and look at this. Fallen rocks. That fallen rock is going to be moved to Jerusalem. The guided one, a blood descendant of Muhammad, who will bear a striking resemblance to him. His coming out will be in Yathrib. Yathrib, by the way, is Medina. Yathrib and Medina. When he is 40 years old, and he will be the hope of Islam. The Mahdi's first challenge, Muhammad can, uh, continues, will be to deal with the descendants of Abu Safan, who will spread corruption and mischief from his base in Damascus, a man so vile he will kill children and rip open the bellies of pregnant women. Sound out what's happening right now? This Sufani, as he will be called, will learn the Mahdi's appearance and will send an army to slay him. But his forces will be swallowed up by the desert. The armies of the Antichrist are going to come after Israel. Now let's look at the Bible prophecy. We're talking about fallen rocks, idols, and we're talking about the real rock of Israel, which is who? Who's the real rock of Israel? Jesus. He wasn't a fallen rock. He was an upright rock. He was the foundation stone of the church, wasn't he? But his forces will be swallowed up by the desert. Now, we have Jesus coming back in the Bible. We have two prophets coming and speaking, don't we? Two prophets are called the two what? Witnesses. And the two witnesses will stand up in Jerusalem and they will preach and they will be slaughtered and murdered, won't they? And they will lay dead for a period of time and then God, and it's going to televise this all over the world. Now, how could that ever be televised in, in uh, uh, 800 A.D., 1500 A.D.? 1600 A.D., 1700 A.D., could this have happened? 1800 A.D., 1900 A.D.? Yeah, by about 1950, 1960, but now everybody's got a television, even those Bedouins out in the tents in the desert with their satellite dishes. <clears throat> and the execution of these two witnesses of God will be televised all over the world. And all of a sudden, they're going to stand on their feet. And that's going to happen right here in the middle of the tribulation period, near the middle of the tribulation period, the seven-year period of time. The Mahdi's appearance will send an army to slay him, but his forces will be swallowed up by the desert. About this time, there will also be wars of succession to the caliphate, this returned caliphate. The caliphate ended from Turkey... By the way, almost all evangelical, uh, including myself for many years, said that Russia, Magog and Gog was Russia, and uh, Togomar, Magog, that's all in Turkey. I don't really know how it ever got started that way, but they thought that Russia was going to be the bad guy, the bear of Russia, and that Russia was going to come against Israel and all that. It's not Russia, it's Islam. That's all talking about the caliphate in Turkey. This is what it's talking about. And from the Turkey, and Turkey is the most moderate of all the Islamic nations today, 
and they believe that the Mahdi is going to come. And, and of course, we're right in Syria where this says all this Islamic end times. Now, this, this Mahdi, this ISIS leader that they have today is calling all Islam back to the faith. Is he or not? Is he or is he not? Is that the news? Yeah, it is. Yes. I read some in the newspaper the last couple of days or somewhere that Israel and Turkey were going to re make an agreement together. That's right. That's what I, I said. Turkey is a mediator, the most moderate mediator. Now, this reluctant leader, this Mahdi, he will flee to Mecca prior to his. Uh, Safani envision, in, in and in Mecca, his admirers will draft him for the role of the caliph by dragging him from his home to the Kaaba, where they will pledge their loyalty to him in front of the black stone. We're talking about fallen rocks. Acts, the 19th chapter. We're talking about Artemis, Diana. We're talking about the Kaaba, the falling stone from, from heaven, which they say is the right hand of Allah. And the Kaaba where they will pledge their loyalty to him in front of the black stone. And the guided one, as he will be called, will accept their pledges. And he will form allies and lead true believers in wars against the apostate Islam. Is that what ISIS is doing today? Those apostate Islam is those that will not go to war. Muhammad all of his preaching in his last days of his life were against the what he called the infidel apostates, the hypocrites. And this man is calling all Islam that will not fight hypocrites and apostates. So he's going to lead his forces. Do you think that this man thinks he's fulfilling this? What do you think? Do you think he's fulfilling? That is eschatology, Islamic eschatology. That's what's going on over there right now. He will form allies and lead true believers in wars against apostates and Christians. Now, Issa, Issa of the Issa is Jesus of the Islam. We have in the Bible we have we have Jesus coming back to protect the Jews. Because God really is going to use the Jews for 1,000 years. They're going, to be a, they're going to be administrators of God's kingdom on terra firma, on this earth for 1,000 years. But the Bible says that five out of every six people in the world, Gentiles, that means everybody but Jews, is going to be killed. Is that what it says, Sister Andino? That's right. And it says that two out of every three Jews in the world are going to be killed. Is that what the Bible says? Yeah. That one-third of the Jews will be left, and not only, only one-third of the Jews, but there's going to be 144,000 of them that are marked from the 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And that there are going to be real special people from then on. He will form alliances and, true, and lead true believers in war against apostates and Christians. Is this what this ISIS is doing today? Is it or is it not? Is that what he says? Is he killing those Islamic people that, that won't fight for and won't follow Muhammad's wishes? Muhammad says, I bring you slaughter. No two religions will exist in this world until I bring the world under one caliphate. That's what he said. Anybody that will not fight for Islam is an apostate and a hypocrite. And you will burn in hell. Muhammad reveals these predictions during the morning session. The believers are seated cross-legged, row after row, and them all the way back to the, to the covered prayer area, and they spill out into the huge courtyard. At the call to noon prayer, he jumps down into the, uh, in, into the mosh pit to lead the congregation, giving them, as always, his example of perfect prayer prostrations and precisely intoned verses. So Muhammad, now he's telling about the Mahdi that's going to come. He's talking about eschatology in Islam. And he jumps down from his pulpit and he goes down there and he sticks his head on the, on the ground and he starts praying toward Mecca. And this is in Medina. Okay? 
Then he's back. Then he's back on stage. He is just warming up. His turban is is tightly wrapped on his head with a trailing edge uh, tossed over his shoulder. He sits in his pulpit throne and closes his eyes to let visions of the future enter his head. Like all gifted preacher, he has a flair for drama. In the near future of the world, Muhammad tells them, the rule of the Mahdi will be one of the first major signs that the hour is approaching. The guided one will reign for seven years and will be the harbinger of the second coming of Jesus, Issa, the son of Mary, and also of the Antichrist, the Jadajel. The Antichrist in Islam, in the Sunnahs and the Quran, a Hadith and a Hadith, is Jesus of the Bible. The Antichrist is. Now the Antichrist in, in the Bible is the Mahdi of the Sunnahs. We got two opposites. We got, we've got juxtaposition people going here side by side. One's evil and one's bad and which one is evil and which one is bad according to which side you're looking at. Islam says that Jesus of the Bible is a bad guy. The Bible says that the Issa of the Islam is the bad guy and that the Mahdi is the Antichrist and we have the beast the Jajel who is known as the great deceiver a powerful but false prophet rumors of Dajel's appearance in the world and will spread after the Mahdi leads an army of believers against the Christians of Syria <coughs> and Byzantium though a third of his warriors will be slain and another third will desert. What's the Bible talking about thirds? Two thirds of the Jews. Now Issa of Islam is going to kill all the Jews. He's going to kill all the Christians and then he's going to kill all the swine because they're a degenerate race of Jews. The Mahdi will be victorious over a massive Syrian army and then he will turn his forces on, on Constantinople. There his troops will yell in unison, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. And the walls of Constantinople will come tumbling down. The Mahdi will not get to enjoy his victory, however, for at that moment word will come that the evil Daje has appeared in Syria and is seducing people to his false religion through sorcery and eloquent words. He's going to perform miracles, this false Antichrist is. This is Muhammad's end time scenario. At this point, like a script, the Dajel, blind in his left eye and with a thick hair all over his body, will come out of Persia, followed by 70,000 Jews dressed in silk. These evil ones, aren't they? Talking about fallen rocks now, talking about fallen people, fallen minds. And silk carrying double edged swords. The evil one will have crooked legs, and branded on his forehead will be the three Arabic letters Kafar, infidel. He will travel in great speeds on, gi on a gigantic mule, one mightier than the winged Barak that had carried Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem. In the Dajjal hands, fire will be, will be water and water filed. He will have with him musical instruments. And what does the Bible say about Jesus? The great hallelujah chorus, remember that when he comes back, the great hallelujah chorus in the background. You see evil called good and good called evil. He will make beautiful music to seduce music lovers. Now Muhammad hated music. He couldn't stand sound. He couldn't stand dogs. He hated dogs because they barked. If anybody came crying and wailing to him, he usually had them killed. He didn't want to. He, he couldn't stand loud loud noises. He was uh, what we call uh, 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 sound overload. He couldn't stand sharp and loud sounds, so he wouldn't let anybody play any musical instruments at all anywhere around him. And he will bring more people to follow him through his ability to perform magic tricks. So clever they will appear to be miracles. In one of these stage tricks, he will slice a man in half and then bring him back to life. In another, he will uh, uh, restore life to a deceased father and his brother. But in fact, they will be devils who have been taken their form. No magic, 
No magic there, only deceit and the works of deceit because it leads to hell. Dajjal will then cause the drought in the land of the true believers of the Muhammad. Is there a drought in the last days? The Bible talks about a drought in the last days. <clears throat> but he will give a horn of plenty to his own followers. Inflated by the power he acquires, he will then attack Yathrib and Mecca. But he will not be able to get beyond its angelic guardians, led by angel Malika. Frustrated by their power, the Dajah will lead his forces north to show down with the Iman Mahdi in Syria. Now, eventually all the followers of the Dajjal will be annihilated. And Jesus will then set up about to kill all the swine of the world. This is their Jesus, the Issa. Let's go back up just a little bit further. He will come neither on a cloud with his hands resting on the shoulders of two angels. If he descends with angels, uh, they will let him down gently near the mosque in Damascus, where the Imam Mahdi is about to lead 1,200 true believers, 800 men and 400 women in dawn prayer. Jesus will enter. This is the Jesus of Issa, of Islam. Jesus will enter the sacred mosque, and I've been in this mosque, by the way. Moments before the Mahdi has commenced praying, and the faithful will turn to look at the newcomer uh, when they hear a voice in their mind saying, The one who listens to your pleas has come. Jesus will introduce himself, and the Mahdi will invite him to lead in prayers. But now the Mahdi is who? Who is the Mahdi? He is a reincarnation of who? Muhammad. He's his direct descendant. But Jesus will gracefully decline and ask the guided one to proceed. Following the prayers, Jesus will announce that that Dajjal, who has just reached the gates of Damascus, is as good as dead. All it will, all it will take is for Jesus to breathe out, and every infidel his breath reaches will drop dead. As far as the eye can see, Jesus goes to the gates of Damascus. The effects of his breath provide a tactical opening for the hordes of troop leaders to come scre screaming down from the mountains where they have been holed up. And they and what does the Bible say that, that these bad people are going to do? They're going to go to the mountains and, and hide in the rocks, aren't they? Is that what the Bible says? Dressed in armor and wielding two swords and a shield, Jesus stalks Dajel on the battlefield. He slays him. In the grand finale in front of one of those gates of the city and leaves the field of battle with his shield splattered with blood of the evil one. Eventually, all the followers of Dajia will be annihilated and Jesus will then set about to kill all the swine. Now, he's killed all the Jews, hasn't he? He's killed all the Christians. Now he's going to kill all the swine. All the swine of the world, loathsome animals because they eat their own excrement. He will also destroy the cross of the false religion that had been created about him. He's going to destroy all Christianity. And that all had wrongly declared that he died on the cross and was resurrected, whereas in truth he was someone who was volunteered to die in his place. Jesus will make it clear that he is merely mortal, a messenger of God, whose truth the Jews denied. Shortly after the slaying of Dajjal, the Imad Mahdi, will die and Jesus will then assume the role of the caliph. The Mahdi reigns how long? Seven. Seven years. The commander of the faithful, Jesus, will visit the grave of Muhammad where he will pay homage to the last and final messenger of God. But despite the death of the Adagio, the worst is not over yet. God will continue to throw challenges at Jesus. At one point, God will inform him that he is releasing the inhabitants of Gog and Magog from their distant iron prison, and they will surge forth all their fury, and they will scorch their way into the land. Where's Gog and Magog? Not, it's not Russia. This is Turkey. All right. And it says half of its warriors will all be able to drink all the water from the lake of Tiberias. That's the, they're going to drink all the water out of the Sea of Galilee. And it will become dry lake bed. 
and they will arrive in Jerusalem and claim we have conquered the people of the earth now we will annihilate those in the sky but then Jesus and his followers will have fled to Mount Sinai and they will suffer hunger and hardship and Jesus will pray to Allah for relief and Allah will uh, honor his prayer by causing sores to appear on the necks of the soldiers and the armies of the Gog and Magog and they will die quick but uh, they will die all they will all die a quick but painful death and Jesus and his followers will then descend from safety to Sinai and they will find a sea of rotting bodies that lets off a horrendous odor of putrefaction. Upon this, Jesus will offer a prayer of supplication to Allah and rid the world of these corpses, and God will send huge birds with necks as thick as the necks of camels, and they will grab the bodies of, with their beaks and dump them in a faraway sea. This is Islamic end time. Is this interesting? Fallen rocks? Fallen rocks? This is from them. Okay, this is their prophecy. Is this guy on television that they're prophesying today all the time? Is he saying this very thing? Is he lying about Islam? Who's lying? Who's lying? Our president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's lying? The German government. Yeah. The British government. Who's lying? This reign of Jesus of Islam will be a utopia. He, be a, he will be a just ruler, a, a, a fair judge, and preach the teachings of Muhammad and his Sunnah, and the details of Muhammad's exemplary life as the last and final messenger of God. The Sharia that Muhammad brought forth in the world, the Sharia? Is America Sharia compliant today? Is it? Are the banks becoming Sharia compliant? Will regulate the lives of all believers. All the disbelievers will... Uh, will convert or will die. All disbelievers will convert or die. Is that what it says always in the Quran? The Meccan verses. Now, we heard Bush quote the, the, the Quran. He said, you kill a, to kill a man is to kill a nation. To save a man is to save a nation. Obama says, quoting the Quran, to kill a man is to kill a nation, to save a man is to save a nation. Do you know that that Quranic verse has completely been abrogated? That was what he was preaching in Mecca when he went to Medina. He said there's only one religion that will last. In, Med in Mecca, he said that Christians might go to heaven, that the Jews might go to heaven. In Medina, he said, oh, unbelievers, but Islam will go to hell. And even Islam will go to hell also unless they die dying for the cause of Allah. That's the only way you get straight to heaven. The Sharia that Muhammad brought to the world will regulate the lives of all believers and all the disbelievers will convert or die leaving only the faithful so that there no longer be any need for the holy war or the taxation of subjugated infidels. Peace will reign throughout the world and even wild animals and snakes and scorpions will become inoffensive and the lamb will lie down with the lion. And wealth will be so abundant that no one will lack anything. The earth will become a cornucopia. Pomegranates will grow so huge that a single one will feed an entire community and its peel will be used for the shade in the hot sun. Every family will have a camel. Every family will have a chicken in the pot. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Every family will have a camel and a goat to supply their needs. And as a result of the guidance of such a righteous ruler as Jesus, people will acquire a love for the prostration of Muhammad's prayer routines more than they love anything else in life. They will pray just like Muhammad. And they will be glad they perform their prayers five times a day. And Jesus will remain on the earth for 40 years and will marry when he is 19 more years to go and will have children and when he dies, he will be buried next to the grave of Muhammad. That's Islam in the end times. That's the fallen rocks. Beware of falling rocks. Okay, beware of falling rocks. Beware of Diana and Islam. What religion today has a lot of Dianas in it? Catholicism. All of these objects of worship, the stations of the cross, all of this. We, we just had Christmas. 
we just had a lot of paganism all over the world. People going to churches and kissing statues and everything else. We have all types of this through the world. The real Jesus of the Bible is the God of the Bible. He is Jehovah. He who shall become came to this world, died for our sins, was buried for three and a half days, rose from the dead, and is on the throne in heaven of God right now, in the third heaven. And there aren't seven heavens, there are three heavens. Science tell you that. And that Jesus is going to come back one of these days. And that Jesus is going to rapture his people up, He's going to allow this tremendous tribulation period, which we see the beginning of today, I believe. I think we're in the beginning of the end times. We're at least preview the coming attractions. The Lord's going to rapture his people up. He's going to deal with the people of the earth, and the earth, 666, the Antichrist is number of 666, man, man, man. Now the Bible says there will be a beast come out of Arabia and he will mark all of the true believers of the devil of the Antichrist on her foreheads and on her arm. The Quran says the Mahdi is going to come, the beast is going to come out and mark all the true believers and they're going to be in the army of the Mahdi and the Mahdi is going to conquer all these people. And then they say Jesus is going to come back and he's going to kill all the Jews He's going to kill all the Christians. He's going to kill all of the hypocrite Muslims. He's going to kill all these people. Kill, kill, kill. Muhammad said, I bring to you peace. Slaughter. Slaughter. Jesus will bring to us peace. The Issa of Islam will bring to you war. War. Jesus, when he comes back from heaven, he's going to bring people in white clothing, white clothing, the saints with him. I think they're going to be there for one reason, to watch him whip the socks off of the Iman, <laughs> the Antichrist and his armies. And he's going to do great miracles, yes he will. He'll do miracles, mir and the earth is going to open up, and it's going to stop those armies of, of whoever comes after him, the Antichrist, which could be Islam, chasing Israel down to Petra. They're going to keep them down there and protect them for how long? Three and a half years. How long is the how long is the siege of the Mahdi? Seven years. Then he will die, and then the Jesus of Islam will come back and take over his reign, and he will reign for how many years? Forty years. And then his children are brought. Is that Bible? Do you know how much anti-Christ that is and anti-God? It couldn't be worse. You saw the parallels today, the falling rock of the Greeks and the Romans and the falling rock of Islam. And then we see the rock of Israel, the rock of Israel. We see that rock. And that is the true rock, isn't it? All right. Go out and do something eternal. And uh, I hope that you learned something from the Word of God today. Let's have a, have a question. Yes, yes, Sister Andy. During the tribulation period, where role the Islamic religion is going to play? Because the Antichrist is going to make a pact with the Jews for the first three and a half Yeah, see, uh, you came in just a little bit late. Oh, we, had, uh, we had the Kaaba being moved by the Mahdi from... Mecca to Jerusalem and they build, a, they build a super mosque, a super temple there and all religions are going to go along pretty good for a little while and the reign of the Mahdi is going to be seven years and we find out of course the Bible says in the middle of that seven year reign he's going to turn on the Jews isn't he? Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the Sunnah and the, the Quran says that that's what's going to happen there also so we see that. I think that Islam is of the Antichrist in the last days. I think that's what it is. That's not what I wrote my master, my doctor thesis on in 1980, but that's what I believe today. Because now I have read the Quran several times, I have read the Sunnahs and the Hadiths <laughs> and the Hadiths and all that, and I see a great parallel there, that that is a great possibility.
That's a possibility that that is who it is. And, of course, everything's working that way, isn't it? I see now also that, I see also that the um, Gog and Magog is not in Ru it's not talking about Russia, it's talking about Turkey, which will be the center of the great caliphate to come. And Turkey is also a moderate which wants to make peace with Israel. And all these years we believe that was Russia. Yes. Yeah. I sure wish Brother Farrar was here today. He would be jumping up and down going like this on the desk. <laughs> He would be all excited. Yes, we've heard that all the time. Uh, I don't believe that now because it's not geographically correct. A lot of those things, uh, there just aren't geographically correct. I've learned some things. Is this Sharon? Um, I thought Gog and Magog was after... The Battle of Gog and Magog is after the Millennium Altar. Right, yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's Battle of Armageddon is over here. But the Battle of Gog and Magog, these people are going to stand up at the end of the reign when... You know, the, the uh, Satan is put in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Right here. See, bottomless pit, uh, Revelation 27 through 9. And then he's released at the end of this, and he goes out and he gathers his, which have lived during that millennial reign. Five-sixths of the world have been destroyed. Two-thirds of the Jews have been destroyed, but the earth is going to be repopulated by the millions again. And Satan is still going to have the hearts of people Regardless of whether he's there or not, there's no demons and no Satan on this earth for a thousand years. But people are still going to be bad. Why? The Adamic nature. All right, anything else? Sister Andino. One of the guys from the ISIS, he said that they are going to start attacking Israel directly. Yes. And, uh, he's following the, what I read to you today. That Mahdi, he thinks he's the Mahdi. He's following the Islamic eschatology to the T and the crossing of the I's and the dotting of the, of the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's. It's exactly, he is doing exactly what Muhammad called for. The man's a true follower of Muhammad. That's all I can say. These other people are lying. And he calls all the other ones hypocrites, so he's killing them. Because Muhammad calls for the death of the hypocrites that wouldn't fight for Allah. They're no good. They're hypocrites. They're infidels. And there's nothing worse. An Islamic person that defects is to be killed. That's it. Killed. Checked if he's in the right mind, first of all. If he's right mind, cut his head off. Yes. And I was, while well, I was listening to that, I said, what is going to happen? Because the pres our president doesn't support Israel. No. I mean, they start Well, he's trying to beat them up, and then it, in the news it also showed how America went in and busted these and killed these, and, and, and ISIS is in the decline, okay? But now he's calling for all 1.5 billion Muslims of the world to back him and get behind him and follow what Muhammad said. Is that what he said or not? What's the, what's the, what's the Quran say? What does the Sunnah say? What does the Hadith say? Is he saying the truth? Yes, he's saying the truth about Islam. Who's not believing the truth? Everybody that doesn't know what's really happening and what's... The man's telling the truth. He's really telling the truth. He's a, he's a rat and an antichrist. A antichrist. I didn't say the antichrist. He's an antichrist. All right? He's an antichrist. There have been many antichrists. But, uh, but he could be. Who knows? All right. You're ready. Let me, uh, do I have any other? I don't want to sh cut you short. Brother David, you got a question? Any, any more? Sister Andino? I'm sorry that I wasn't late. <laughs> That's all right. You're here. Anything else? All right. I'm going to give it to David in a minute. Let me shut these cameras off. Thank you for your attention. Go out and do something eternal. You got more ammunition now. Deal with it.